Good morning, and as I hope you can see behind me, it's a sun-kissed, balmy, optimistic mood in Cornwall as world leaders burble and munch their way through dilemmas and differences. But for many of us, there is a dark cloud hanging over it all. Not literally, and not even in the potential trade war looming with the EU, but rather the threat that the ending of restrictions in England later this month is no longer on offer. China may or may not be winning on the world stage, but Covid seems to be winning here at home. So what really would that delay be for? And can Boris Johnson hold his increasingly impatient party together if he decides to impose it? To talk about all of that and many of the other issues at the G7, I'll be joined live by the Foreign Secretary, Dominic Raab, and by the Shadow Trade Secretary, Emily Thornbury, to set out the science and the hard choices behind tomorrow's announcement on restrictions. I'm joined by the sage and nerve tag advisor, Professor Andrew Hayward. But there's more. Of course there is. I've been talking to Joanna Scanlon about secrets, lies and the enduring power of love. Reviewing the news on a sun-kissed morning, Harry Cole, political editor of The Sun and our own political editor, the irrepressible Laura Koonsberg. Now, we have the great good luck to be broadcasting to you from Tate St Ives, a glorious contemporary art gallery right on the sea's edge. And the news this morning is that their collection here is fabulous. Barbara Hepworth, Patrick Heron, you name it. But I suspect there may be other news today as well, so it's over to Chris Mason in London. Thank you, Andrew. Good morning. The Denmark midfielder Christian Eriksen is said to be awake in hospital after collapsing during the Euro 2020 match against Finland last night. The former Spurs player received life-saving treatment on the pitch after he fell to the ground. The game was suspended before half-time, but later resumed. A decision on whether to lift all of England's lockdown restrictions on the 21st of June is expected to be taken later today. It's before the Prime Minister makes an announcement tomorrow. However, he has already said the government must be cautious as hospital admissions increase. The BBC has been told that a delay of up to four weeks is being considered. Sir David Attenborough will warn the G7 leaders that the choices they make on climate change will be some of the most important in human history. It's as the final day of the summit in Cornwall gets underway. The seven world leaders are also expected to pledge to almost halve their emissions by 2030. And the Prime Minister will say he's launching a fund worth half a billion pounds to protect the world's oceans and marine life. Israel is expected to swear in a new coalition government this afternoon, which will span the political spectrum under a power-sharing deal. It will end Benjamin Netanyahu's record five terms as Prime Minister. After a total of 15 years in power, he is Israel's longest-serving leader and one of the longest currently serving democratic leaders in the world. He remains on trial for corruption, which he denies. And the Queen will host the US President and First Lady at Windsor Castle later this afternoon as the G7 summit in Cornwall draws to a close. Joe Biden and his wife Jill will be welcomed by a guard of honour followed by tea at the Royal Residence. He is the 12th US leader the Queen has met during her reign as monarch. That's all the news for me so far this morning. The next news here on BBC One is at one o'clock. Back to you, Andrew. Thank you, Chris. You did that beautifully. And now, as ever, to the front pages and the Sunday Telegraph. Lots to read today. The Sunday Telegraph there, its splash will chill a lot of people if you can see that. There are fears, it says, that restrictions could be in place until the spring. We'll talk about that shortly. Uh, they've also got another story from the summit here, which is sparking a lot of comment this morning. Macron, it says, triggers Johnson's fury by claiming Northern Ireland is not part of the UK. They apparently had a really, really brisk conversation on the beach last night. Uh, the Observer picks up on the kind of theme of, of Brexit versus the rest of the agenda. And Brexit bust up, it says, torpedoes the Prime Minister's bid to showcase global Britain. I'll be asking Laura and Harry about that. But of course, a lot of the newspapers are focusing on, that, on the drama on the football pitch last night. 
and Christian Eriksen there. Thank God he's alive, it says. He is alive this morning and awake, apparently, in hospital, we hear. Miracle on the pitch is the Sunday Mirror's take on that. And then, finally, the Sunday Times has gone on a story they've been pursuing for some time. Ban ministers from lobbying for five years. That's their call this morning on the front page, following the little local difficulty, you may remember, that David Cameron has been under. Now, we've been talking about all of those things. Let's start with Laura and that, funny, that, that front page story on the Sunday Telegraph, which, as I say, will chill and worry a lot of people. I think that's right. I mean, so the Telegraph is suggesting suggesting that if there is a delay, which we expect now there to be a delay in the lifting of the restrictions, that may only leave a very short window of opening up in the summer and then restrictions coming back in some force and sort of this kind of on again, off again, on again, off again, actually leaving the Freedom Day, as it was always billed, until next spring. Now, this is still based on a very, very big if. There's a lot of speculation in this there story, is. and it appears to be based on a sort of quote from one senior minister saying they're worried that we might end up in that kind of situation. What we do, however, pretty much know is that the Prime Minister tomorrow will announce that there's going to be some kind of delay to the planned lifting of limits in yes. England on the 21st of June because as coronavirus has been starting to creep up again, so too has the realisation in government crept up that actually lifting off everything now, in their view, despite the views of some noisy Tory about ventures, would be the wrong thing to do at this moment. And the answer instead is to keep trying to get as many vaccines and as many arms as possible. But there's always two sides to this. I mean, we're in lovely St Ives, where a lot of businesses, a lot of shops and some pubs and restaurants have already gone out of business. Lots of people watching this will be thinking, my job's now at risk, my business is at risk. Harry, What's the view of the Sun readers about this great issue? I think the, the one thing that people don't want to happen is the, the sort of hokey-cokey we got into last year of going backwards and forwards into lockdowns, out of lockdowns, pubs reopening, pubs shutting, curfews. And I think, I think a, a slight delay could be stomached if, as the Prime Minister has said, this is, this is the last lockdown, and this really has to be. And the worst of all worlds would be coming out too early and then, and then having, to, having to close pubs and go backwards. Right so go spring. forwards r slowly rather than go backwards. I think it would be, think where we'll be very interesting are. to hear what Dominic Robb says about all of this shortly. Um, now, the other big story, as I alluded to just now, was the increasingly fractious standoff between the UK and the EU mm. over Northern Ireland, or what your newspaper describes as the sausage wars. <laughs> the sausage, it's an intro you could only dream of, really. Um, look, the Perfect world, sun intro. world leaders have, uh, haven't been able to meet for two years because of COVID. They've come back to, they've got round the table again, they've met each other and they've fallen out about Brexit. Who would have, who would have seen that one coming? Mm. Um, so the uh, remarkably well-sourced, given I can think only two people were in the conversation, uh, Macron uh, appears to have suggested that Northern Ireland isn't really part of the United Kingdom. So Boris Johnson had said to Macron, yeah, how yeah. would you feel if Toulouse sausages couldn't be exported to Paris because of the French courts? To which Macron said, aha, it's not, it's different. Huh? Exactly. And now that is a fairly di large diplomatic clangor, I would say. And you can see why some people would be, would like that out there being, you know, the mm. Prime Minister's got that, got that, that gaff yeah. out there. It does really go to show that, you know, it, we're years and years into this Brexit route, and it still seems some of the key players don't quite understand the fundamentals. And the EU have made such a, you know, such a big deal, rightly so, out of the, how the Northern Ireland situation will work. And, you know, you've got mm. one of the major leaders of the European Union still seemingly, to do, willingly or otherwise, fundamentally not understand the issues. And so, Laura, we've now got this issue in some views, completely overhanging the entire G7, all the issues about China and global warming and the seas and all the rest of it. Brexit hanging over that. The Observer has gone very hard on that on their front page. Too hard, do you think? They have. I mean, they've said a Brexit bust-up has torpedoed the <laughs> Prime Minister's bid to showcase global Britain. Now, certainly, this has been an issue at the summit, no doubt about it. Yeah. Certainly, both sides have used this as an occasion to underline their grumpiness because the UK is very frustrated about this, the EU is very frustrated about this, and they've used the meetings in the margins as an occasion to really kind of butt heads mm. over it. Has it completely made the whole thing about Brexit? I don't think that's actually the case. And I think from Downing Street's point of view... And you've been speaking to him. You don't think yes, Boris Johnson would see it like that? I don't think Boris Johnson would see it like that, partly because nobody expected this to be the denouement, the deadline when this problem actually had to be resolved or not. That said, don't, you know, don't, don't, don't doubt the fact it. that it is grumpy, it's problematic, and there is a deadline. It has to be sorted out in the next few weeks because of how the regulations and grace periods and all those kinds of things have been working. But I don't feel as if the whole thing has been blown off course by Brexit.
Harry, I have done an awful lot of summits, and I can't remember one where the picture editors and all the newspapers have had such a good time compared to the ordinary editors. This has been, more than anything I can remember, a summit of images. Absolutely. And lots and lots of newspapers are pictures of, of Wilf, uh, Boris's little baby with his tousled hair on the, on the sea's edge and all the leaders with their shoes off. It's been a very, very different kind of summit, hasn't it? Absolutely. I mean, every single lever of soft power that Britain has has been yanked uh, this, uh, this, this week from the Queen to David Attenborough today to the tiny pocket rocket of the Diplomacy, as they're, uh, they're named, uh, little, little one-year-old Wilf, who seems to have charmed the world leaders. I mean, and what an advert! Look at this for for, mm. for this part of the world and for this country. Lots of people, you know, would have said this summit was never going to happen. If you believe the naysayers over the last few years, you suggest that you know Britain would be isolated, lonely, and as a bit of a pariah, Luxembourg with nukes, as someone uh, <laughs> someone mm. once described it. And actually, it's not. It's been a fantastic uh, image, and you're so right. The pictures have just been Amazing. stunning. This backdrop is extraordinary. Look Laura, before we came on air, mm. I said to you, both of you, um, is there one piece of writing that made you laugh more than anything else that was really well done? And you've come back with an answer, and it's India Night. That's right, India Night. In the Night. Sunday Times. In the, and in just the, before you read some, I should explain to people that she thinks this is a really sort of beachy, boho kind of summit, and she imagines all down there with their barbecues and indeed indulging in a certain amount of cannabis while they're there. <laughs> we, it's, it's, been, it's, been a, it's been a surreal summit, and this is perhaps the most surreal image for it. Just read us Yes, and we, and we should say the cannabis suggestion is something that she's doing as a speculative, <laughs> imaginary what's if. We did see Angela Merkel inspecting the mackerel at the barbecue last night, but there is no so evidence that there was no, anything. No, no the smoke was, was from the fire. Yes, right. so, okay. But India Night, but. It's, a, it's a very, very funny um, column, imagining what might, might, what might have been going on. And she said, I can't help imagining Angela Merkel would take impressively enormous drags and become extremely giggly. She's leaving soon, so wouldn't care what anyone thought of her impromptu cartwheels or Trump impressions. Ursula von der Leyen, the European uh, Commission president, would become weirdly intense in 17 languages. <laughs> <laughs> and either Emmanuel Macron or Justin Trudeau would snitch. <laughs> very funny, very <laughs> funny piece. Goes. Well worth reading. read. There is such a lot to read in the papers today. Um, thanks both very much. Is, is there a final thought, Harry Cole, from this summit? I mean, we all came down expecting a huge bust-up with the EU, we've got a sort of minor bust up. What about the rest of it? There's been lots and lots of announcements coming pouring out yeah. on global warming, money for the seas, and so forth. Uh, uh, yeah, I think they're trying to fuse this idea that you know the recovery from COVID has to be uh, you know an eco recovery, and we we'll hear a lot about that. But actually, I think the the, the images of the seven of them united in the NATO conference on. Um, on Monday, I think, will be closely watched in Beijing. Certainly will. It will be very important, though, to see the actual black and white yes. of the deal that comes out at the end of tonight. You know, the images are the fun Absolutely. bit and the alchemy matters, Absolutely. but the actual details later are really Laura, important. one other thing that I was thinking about, because I've been talking to people around here, I might have had the occasional sneaky pint in an occasional <laughs> sneaky pub, and what people here say is this is supposed to be a global warming moment. We've had lots of Extinction Rebellion protesters and so forth. This is supposed to be the biggest thing yeah. facing the planet at the moment. And, yes, we've had community and so forth, we haven't really had a sense that they, the leaders, have got it, particularly since they've been arriving by Chinook, helicopter and private plane and motorcade and all the rest of it. Yes, and the Queen got the train, though, remember? The Queen but, got uh, the but train. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the presidents and prime ministers yeah. all brought their own planes. They didn't even, you know, mm. <laughs> come, come together from London. I think that's, that's right. I mean, there have been various announcements. It will be important later tonight to see, actually, where they've got to. One, there's been a concept that actually Prince Charles was pushing about getting cheap loans into the developing world to help them um, yes. start to cut their emissions. But I think one of the reasons why there ha it hasn't felt like there's been a big breakthrough is because part of what's been going on is the groundwork for the next big jamboree like this, which might feel a bit different, mm. November in Glasgow, <laughs> in the uh, COP26, which is a huge, big, sort of global moment. So we get this big communique. Mm. Uh, Harry Cole, you were talking earlier on about that great phase of bamboo curtain around <laughs> China. Yes. What, where do you think the West is going to stand after all of this? Is this going to be a moment when the West comes back or not? I think it's, uh, there's a slight element to herding cats as, uh, mm. about this. You know, mm. Boris Johnson's been charging around the summit telling world leaders that he's a sinophile still, uh, whereas, you know, you know the, the range of, uh, of opinion about China is, is very uh, is very stretched, and it'd be yeah, as Laura said, it'd be fascinating to see what tortured form of words they come up with for the communique. And but they probably will sign it, unlike the Trump era, where these things get ripped up. Thanks to both my observers right on the front line, <laughs> Harry Cole, Laura Coonsbo, that's been brilliant. Thanks very much indeed. And the weather.
Everybody down here in Cornwall is, of course, delighted to see the sun. I have to say, a lot of them seem a little bit surprised as well. How long will it go on? Over to Matt Taylor in the weather studio. Matt. Thank you very much, Andrew. Well, the sunshine and heat on and off through the days ahead. But today is going to be one of the hotter days more widely across the country. Plenty of sunshine for many of you, but there is some cloud North Wales, Northern England. That will break up to sunny spells. Some sunny spells across much of Scotland, Northern Ireland, but towards the Hebrides and later the Highlands, Orkney, Shetland, the cloud thickens even further. Outbreaks of rain, bit of a breeze here. So one of the cooler spots today, 26 degrees or to the east of Scotland, widely in the mid to high 20s across England and Wales, 28, 29 with high pollen levels across uh, the southeast corner. Now, as we go through this evening and overnight, that fresher air pushes southwards across Scotland and Northern Ireland with some outbreaks of rain for a time. Stays humid, though, for England and Wales. A very muggy night. Temperatures no lower than around 15 or 16 degrees to start Monday morning. And that humid air will eventually get squeezed back to the far south as our weather front pushes its way southwards. Patchy rain will drizzle Northern England, North Wales to begin with, but brightening up later. Sunshine and showers for Scotland, maybe Northern Ireland. But sunny spells and mostly dry elsewhere, but still hot in the southeast corner, maybe 28, 29 degrees. That humid air eases a little bit as we go through into Tuesday across the south but temperatures actually build elsewhere and by the end of Tuesday and into Wednesday it's going to be humid again Andrew with some more sunshine and later some storms back to you my goodness good for some it's never good for everybody is it now then it all seems very likely if not inevitable, that all legal restrictions on social distancing will not end on June the 21st. The Prime Minister said there are grounds for caution ahead of tomorrow's announcement on what comes next for how we deal with coronavirus, particularly in England. But if we face a delay, what will the government actually use it for? And more important still, will it work? If not, we could be in the very same situation in July. I've been speaking to Professor Andrew Hayward from UCL. He advises the government's SAGE Committee and NERVTAG, the new and emerging virus threat advisory group. And I began by asking him what the numbers tell us this morning. Well, I think it's now very clear that we will have a substantial third wave of infections. The, the, the really big question is how much that wave of infections is going to translate into hospitalizations. Uh, the fact that we've got 55% of the adult population double vaccinated means that this would be substantially less bad than it could have been. Uh, but we still don't know exactly how bad it could be. And what we do know is that this new variant is at least 60% more infectious, but also more likely to put people into hospital. Looking at those two numbers, what does that tell us about the weeks ahead? Well, I think 60% more infectious uh, is, is extremely worrying. That's the main thing that will drive the speed with which um, the, the next wave comes along. Uh, and the fact that the level of hospitalizations uh, from this infection appear to be uh, maybe up to double those uh, from the previous infection is, of course, also extremely concerning, even in the context of, uh, uh, of people having had a single dose of vaccine. And I think that one of the key problems is the first dose of the vaccine um, really only reduces the risk of infection by about one third. Uh, and so we really need both doses before we uh, get to a good level of protection. Yeah. If you look at all of those graphs, they're going shooting up quite fast. Do you think there is any chance at all that we will lift all restrictions going ahead from, from later in this month? Well, I think when you look at those graphs shooting up, what we're really seeing, depending on where you live in the country, is a, a doubling time of somewhere between every week and every two weeks. Uh, if we look at the ONS infection survey, there's about one in 500 of us infected so far. And that may not sound much, but actually that's only three or four doubling times away from reaching the levels of infection that we were at the um, height of the second wave of infection. So uh, I, I think if we were to open up more, that will just really fan the flames uh, and lead to this increasing even faster. So does that mean personally, I mean, I know you're a scientist and you hover over the data the whole time, but personally, in your opinion, would it be irresponsible to open up completely on the 21st? Well, the way I look at it is with, you know, if we're driving down a, a road and you're coming up to a bend and you're not quite sure what's around that bend, but you think there might be something bad, you don't put your foot on the accelerator. Uh, if anything, you slow down, not speed up. And I think it's analogous to that. Uh, I think we've got to be really cautious uh, because there is still a substantial chance that we could have a wave of hospitalizations that could put very substantial pressure on the NHS at a time that it's really trying to deal with the enormous backlog of 
cases uh, and people waiting for uh, hospital care. Now, as I understand it, whatever happens, at some point there is going to be some kind of new peak. Uh, scientists talk about the sweet spot. So is there a danger if we delay too long now that we push that peak of infections towards the winter and the autumn when the NHS is already under more strain? Well, I think we made that mistake in the uh, first wave of the pandemic, thinking, oh, we've got to get the timing of this exactly right. The fact is, uh, if you've got a big wave coming towards you, you need to start to take action uh, rather than just wait and see what happens. So I'm, I, I think we deal with the winter when the winter comes. I want to ask you about some other figures from Public Health England, and this is of the 42 people who've died from the Delta variant in the last reporting period. It turns out that 12 of them died 14 days after their second dose of vaccine. So 12 of them were double vaccinated and died nonetheless. How worried should we be about that? Well, I think uh, any vaccine is not 100% effective, so you expect some of the deaths to uh, happen in people who have been fully vaccinated. It looks like uh, double vaccination is uh, certainly at least uh, over 90% effective in preventing infections and deaths. Uh, but nevertheless, if you have very high rates of infection, and that's against the background of an increase, an increase in severity of the infection, then yes, you would expect deaths uh, amongst people who have been double vaccinated. On the other hand, uh, I, I don't think that should be a huge concern for people who have been double vaccinated, as their individual risk may be quite low. We used to have the highest vaccine rate in the world uh, in terms of the speed of vaccinations, and we're now falling behind lots of other countries, including you know, France, Italy, Germany, Uruguay. Um, are we vaccinating fast enough to beat the virus at this point. The Prime Minister talks about a race between vaccinations and the virus. Are we vaccinating fast enough to win that race now? Well, I think when we talk about that race, uh, obviously there's two sides of it. One is how fast we can vaccinate, and the other is how fast, uh, how much we can slow the virus down through social restrictions. Um, I think we're obviously vaccinating very much as fast as we can and amongst the fastest in the world. Um, but we still have a substantial number of people who have not been double vaccinated and that's the absolute priority is to get those second vaccines in if it wasn't for the level of vaccination that we currently have we would be in a very different situation than we are now uh, and, and and really extraordinarily concerned never mind double vaccination i think there are 11 and a half million adults in the uk who haven't been vaccinated at all and are entirely unprotected, would a two-week delay in the restrictions being lifted be enough time to vaccinate those people? I'm not sure it's that helpful to put exact timings on things like that. I, I think throughout this roadmap process, what we've needed to do is to um, re really follow the data along the way and, and, and then take action. And I think when you, when you put arbitrary dates on things, that creates an enormous amount of pressure and expectation. Do you think we should be vaccinating school children? I think uh, there is a case for vaccinating school children, uh, but, but not until such time as we've vaccinated the adult population. Professor Hayward, I guess a lot of people have been watching this and thinking, hold on a second, we were told that we were going to vaccinate all the most vulnerable people and then we could open up again. Why isn't that happening? I think the reason that it's not happening is because no vaccines are 100% effective and because we have a new variant that is much more transmissible and has a higher level of severity. And that means that despite the fact that a high proportion of the vulnerable population are vaccinated, we may still end up with many, many people in hospital. Now, fortunately, it looks as though the people who end up in hospital are much less likely to end up in ITU or to die than they were previously, but still, um, going into hospital will be an unpleasant experience. People may continue to be ill for months after they come away from hospital, possibly longer. Um, and, and of course, whenever somebody's in hospital with COVID, then that causes disruption to the NHS and stops us working through the backlog of uh, activity that we need to catch up on. Professor Hayward, some really hard decisions coming very, very soon. Thanks so much for joining us this morning. That's a pleasure. 
and Labour's Shadow International Trade Secretary, Emily Thornby, is with me here in St Ives. Uh, welcome. Now, looking at the data that we have in front of us now, not more data to come, but what we know now, do you think it's dangerous for the government to remove all restrictions on the 21st of June? I think it's kind of factored in. I think everybody knows that that's likely to happen. Um, what we just need to be confident about is that the government is what is following the science. And we know that they haven't really done that very often in the past. There have been too many times when there's been lapses, but they do need to do that. And next, they need to communicate why they're doing it and explain. So that leads me to the next obvious question, which is, what is this for? What is this, if it's a four-week delay or an eight-week delay, we don't know. But what would the delay be actually for? What would improve in the situation during delay that we don't have now? Um, again, I mean, I presume that the advice, and I'm making presumptions about the advice, but the advice is that given the Delta variant that's come in, given how it, uh, it has a different effect on people, we need to make sure that we have a greater proportion of the population vaccinated. I mean, it does, so you know... So would you be calling for the vaccinations to be speeded up now? Well, they are speeding up. I mean, they are going really fast and uh, it just needs extra time, I think. Um, and we just need to be realistic about that. What we don't want to do is find ourselves in a situation where it takes hold, it changes, we then all need boosters. You know, I mean, it's such a shame, isn't it, actually, that they didn't close the borders faster than they did. I do think that Boris Johnson kept the border with India open until the last minute because he still had this fantasy that he was going to be able to go off to India and somehow or other get some sort of pre-deal deal with them. So if you were sitting in government right now, what kind of restrictions would you think need to be continued while we try and vaccinate everybody? We need to make sure that we have the borders properly closed. Um, and that's been our policy. No, no, no. So I'm talking about people coming into the country. You know, it, it's still too chaotic. We still, people still are, don't have very clear ideas as to what they can do and what they can't. I think this is the last push mm. and we need to make sure that it's done properly. The last push. No, I do know that lots and lots of people watching have got businesses yes, or may think they're going to lose their jobs as a result they of this. They want to get married. So, <laughs> so what kind of restrictions do you think are still essential? Masks, um, social distancing, keeping lots of uh, theatre and football stadia closed, what, what, what would be your, as it were, here's the bad news message to people watching now, if you were in power? I think that you would have to sit, listen to what was the scientists were, being, were, were saying, make the decision and then make a, give a clear answer and make sure that all of your ministers are saying the same thing, there isn't any contradiction, and that mm. people get it. You know, they have... I mean... One can understand when it first happened that there was a certain amount of chaos, but frankly, this has been going on for more than a year now. And, you know, we have brilliant scientists. We have a fantastic National Health Service. We are getting everybody vaccinated. You know, the loose, the, 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 the weak link is government ministers not making decisions fast enough and not communicating them properly. And well, that, you know, it's about time. They, this is their last opportunity. Let's get this right this time. OK, well, let's turn to one of the really difficult decisions, which yeah. I'm going to ask you for a view on, which is that... We've stopped giving AstraZeneca doses to the under 40s because of the relatively remote but real threat of blood clots. Yeah. Now with this new variant, obviously under 40s are much more at risk than they were before. Do you think that the balance of risk has changed so that we should now start to give AstraZeneca vaccines, of which there are plenty, by the way, to under 40s? I mean, I think that... <laughs> They, the scientists have said that the, that the advice that they gave was borderline cautious, or on, the, on the more cautious side. It then changes with surrounding circumstances. So, you know, so they were saying, what were, the, what, were the, what were the risks of getting COVID if you were under 40 mm. compared to the risk of getting the... Right. And, if yes. the and if the risk of getting COVID is that much greater, then it may well be that the balance goes the other way. But in so, the end, you follow the, what the scientists say. Sure. Sorry, I'm not copying out. I'm, say, I'm trying to be consistent. You have to follow the, the scientists. Advice. Yes, but I, I, I hear that. But at the same time, this is a political decision in the end because it's a difficult one. It's not, not one the scientists can be definitive about. But it sounds to me like you're overall, you would say, yes, it's time to start to give AstraZeneca to under 40s well, because mean, it's, of the, it's, the new variant. You know, I, all of my kids have had AstraZeneca and they're under 40, um, under 30. Mm. Um, and that's what they've done. I mean, so, there's, so there's, there's a board, chance. Um, in the same spirit that these are very hard decisions, and looking at what's going on around the country and around the world, do you think all those people sitting at home now thinking, I'm going to book a summer holiday abroad, are fantasising? I think it's very unlikely that people will be able to go abroad this summer, I'm afraid. I think that that is likely to be. But, you know, again, we need to hear what the ministers say. They need to give us clear, clear instructions. People will do the right thing so long as they know what it is that they're expected to do. But the problem has been time and time again is that it really hasn't been clear.
Let's turn to the other big row, which is over Brexit, sausages and Northern Ireland. Now, it's reported that President Macron told the Prime Minister on the beach last night that Northern Ireland was not a full part of the UK in the same way that Toulouse was a part of France. What would be your message to President Macron over that? The UK is the UK. It is a sovereign nation. We are, we are a united nation. But what we need to do is to sort out the problems of the, of the protocol and make sure that we are are doing everything we can to support the Good Friday Agreement. So we need to sort it out. And part of that is to stop bickering and actually find a practical solution. What needs to happen is that Britain and Europe needs to have a veterinary agreement. So we need to have an agreement on the export of meat and, and, and uh, food across the border. And we don't have it at the moment. We right. don't have anything. You know, I mean, America has a better deal than with Europe than okay. we do. If, if that means aligning to EU rules, as the so-called Swiss-style arrangement would mean, would, should we do it? Well, the Swiss style, I mean, the Swiss style arrangement has the advantage of you can, you can, you can say certain, you will take certain things out and the rest of it will, mm. you will have an alignment. But look, let me put but it this... Is, sorry, that is the EU's offer. Should yeah, we accept yeah. it? Well, I mean, I personally think that that's the most, the most realistic. In the end, you know, the government ministers mm. say that we are going to keep to so, food standards, food and farm standards from the European Union. In fact, we're going to make them better. Now, if that's right... What is the problem? So, uh, here's the problem. What? Um, which is that doing this Swiss-style deal means that we have to dynamically align and continue to align with EU standards. Now, if we're aligning with EU standards, we can't do the trade deals with Australia right. Right. or the United right. States that well, they're trying the to rub. do. That's the rub. So, the question is this, right? What you... What with respect, I would suggest you ask ministers, is what well, food and farm standards okay. do you want to drop? What do you want... What, in what okay. way do you want Britain to be worse than the rest of Europe? So, and what trade deals do you want to do with who? You know, yeah. what chlorinated chicken, what antibiotic use, what... Well, while, what you know... While, while you're here, your job while, not, not while you're here yeah, just... let me ask you, <laughs> would you junk these trade deals with Australia and the US? No, of course I would not. I but absolutely if you're, if would you're... not. I, what I would do is you... I would do I, trade I'm... deals in the way that every other country in the entire world does them, which is this. You look to make but... a trade deal that's in the interest of your country. But so you look that... to see what's in the interest of Britain okay. and you'll make a trade deal in, a, in, a, in line with that. You but... won't say, oh, I want to be able to make a trade deal with America sometime but in the future. I'm, I'm Therefore, so... I'm going to drop my food standards... In, sure. in the hope that the Americans sometime in the future will agree a trade deal with me. No, I wouldn't do that. But if we are aligned, if we are dynamically aligned with the EU, we can't do those trade deals with Australia and the United States. We just can't well, do, do them. You, have you, but you so, just heard it, what the President of the United States has said. He said that his priority is the Good Friday Agreement and not a trade deal with the UK. So, you know, it's... I mean, they're thinking mm, in the long yes. term, they're thinking that what's important is peace in Ireland, which, of course, it is, and that, and that a trade deal is a very long way down the track. And, frankly, we okay. bank that. And when we go back into the negotiating table with the Americans, okay. we say, now, look, we have done an alignment with the EU. We have kept a soft border in Ireland. Don't start telling us we need to have chlorinated mm. chicken or mm. woman injected beef or so antibiotic we, we, use or anything else. So then we may else. well not get the deal. It sounds to no. me slightly as if the trade deal that you really want is with the EU. No, I want to be able to have a decent trade deals around the world. And frankly, you know, we have many opportunities. There are, mm. there are things that we are doing well. Like, for example, okay. the recent deal with Norway, we had a recognition of pro professional qualifications, much better than the trade deal we have with the European Union. Okay. And it's the sort of thing that we we ought to have, right. you know, with Australia and America right. and so on. Truth or dare moment, but without the dare, just the truth <laughs> bit. You have always thought that Brexit was a terrible mistake and you would like us to reverse in due course if we can. Yes, but it's happened. It's happened and we've left and, frankly, we're not going to be able to rejoin. We're not going to be able to rejoin because what I have learned in this job is that if you join a trade bloc, you have to join with their rules. So the government talk about CPTPT, which is the Trans-Pacific Partnership, right? They are already a bloc with their own rules. Now, if we're going to join, we have to join on their rules, we have to take mm. their rules. If we want to rejoin the European Union, we have Same to join thing. with their rules as they are now. Now, we had a number of things that were actually quite good for us. Mm. You know, not being in the Euro, not being in Schengen, a whole lot of things. Mm. But if we rejoin the EU now, we would have to it's take all deal. of those joints. Yeah. And okay. I don't think the British public would accept it. So I'm afraid, with a heavy heart, <laughs> we're out. All and right. we remain out. All right. Truth. Thank you very much indeed. That was very Pleasure. good of you to come all the way down here and talk no, to us. Thanks great. so much. <laughs> now then, uh, comedy classics such as The Thick of It and Getting On have showcased the wonderful acting talents of Joanna Scanlon. In After Love, a powerful new movie which takes on a profoundly serious role playing a woman who converts to Islam on marriage. 
Now, after many years together, many happy years, her husband dies unexpectedly. His widow is shocked to discover that he had a secret life in Calais. Now, when I spoke to Joanna, I asked her why her character, Mary, wants to travel from her home in Dover to find out everything about his deceit. I think there was a great love in this marriage, clearly. They, they were, in themselves, happy together. Um, and when she discovers on his death that there is something completely aberrant and against everything that she has given up, she's taken on a religion, she's taken on seriously the practice of that religion, and he appears to have disregarded the things that she has taken on and a sacrifice, actually that she decides she is just completely curious. Curiosity is the driver. Absolutely. And you play, very convincingly, a Muslim convert. Now, I don't know whether you are religious yourself or whether you did a great deal of research, but you absolutely convince the viewer that you are a Muslim woman. Oh, uh, thank you. I mean, that, that is, it is, in many ways, it was a completely new world for me. I had to do a lot of research, and Aleem Khan, the brilliant writer-director of this film, um, he was my guide, as was his mother, who is herself a convert. Mm. I think it did connect, actually, with my own background as a, if from quite a devout Catholic family, Roman Catholic family, and my Catholic education. And the bits of my Catholic education that I can remember pre-Vatican II, particularly, I was only very young, but I can remember the, the way in which the religious practice went hand in hand with the belief and that those two things were together, mm. which I think um, those two things have somehow departed I, from one another. I think, in our modern versions of uh, Christian and even Catholic practice. That's really interesting. I hadn't really thought about this before, but there are clear parallels between pre-Vatican II Roman Catholicism and Islam. But I don't know whether this is a film really about the status of Muslims in Western society, because there is a very compelling moment when you arrive at the door of the other woman, you knock on the door and she opens the door, and there you are in your hijab, and she says, ah, yes, you're here to do the cleaning. Je peux vous aider? Oh, uh, uh. Ah, vous êtes de l'agence? Mais je n'ai jamais confirmé. Pardon, madame. Um, uh, I'm sorry. I am... Um, I'm confused. You are here for the cleaning? It rings true to me of the, the, the kind of condemnatory classifications of people and how that kind of snobbery, whether it's French to English, English to French, within uh, within the UK, within uh, religions and, and classifications of people. I, I, I find it upsetting, actually. Uh, and, and in that moment, as we played the scene and she looked down at me and she saw my hijab and she just went, mm, you're the cleaner. Mm. I was shocked to my core. It's a very serious film, of course, and yet you are known, let's be honest, as a comedy actor. You didn't even send that email. It was still in drafts, OK? <laughs> then secondly, it was you that told me to make that big attack on the BBC. That's right. And I'm afraid we did look silly, running around outside, getting in and out of a car. I think you're wrong, Malcolm. You're like a sultana in a salad. Is this the kind of film that you, as an actor, have been waiting for and looking for all along? <laughs> I, I, it's not necessarily a role I'm looking for all along, but it, when I look at it, it, it does feel more like me. It, it, I recognise more of myself in this serious sort of rather bleak, intense universe. And I have never really found myself to be somebody who's particularly funny, even though other people do laugh at me. Joanna, we are all slowly, nervously tiptoeing out of the world of Covid. What's next for you? Yes, I'm um, filming at the moment The Larkins, which is a, a new adaptation by Simon Nye of the brilliant H.E. Bates books, The Darling Buds of May, and then there were many others after that as well, but about the Larkin family, and it is a lovely, lovely world to be in. Eleven of the most powerful people in the world have gathered here in Cornwall with grand plans to thrash out a path to global recovery from the pandemic, new measures to combat climate change and an agreement on how the world should work together against China. But despite these lofty ambitions, Brexit and the increasingly fractious dispute with the EU over trade 
has uh, inflamed relations and overshadowed at least part of this event, the government will tomorrow announce what, if any, restrictions will be lifted on June the 21st. Remember that was the date when it was all legal restrictions on social distancing were going to be removed. Dominic Raab, the Foreign Secretary, is inside the security zone and he joins me now from there, from Tregana Castle, overlooking Carbis Bay, just down the coast from here. Uh, Dominic Raab, from the data that you have seen, can the Prime Minister abolish the restrictions on the 21st? Well, just to slightly correct uh, what you said, of course, we said we would move to step four no earlier than the 21st of June. We've got over three quarters of people in this country, adults, with uh, uh, their first dose. Around 55%, my understanding, is with their second dose. And what we know is when you get up to the second dose, you're the most effective, not just against the virus, but against the Delta variant and other variants. So we're looking at that data in real time, and the PM will set out uh, the, the position tomorrow on the basis that we want to move out of lockdown irreversibly, and that means we need to be very careful about that data. It sounds to me as if irreversible means that we cannot abolish those restrictions on the 21st. Let's just look at the data that we've got and we know about. Cases are increasing exponentially. This new Delta variant is at least 60% more transmissible and twice as likely to put you in hospital. One vaccine dose offers less protection and two about the same. Apart from that, is there any other data that we have to wait for before these decisions are taken? Oh, the crucial thing in the four tests that we set at the outset of the roadmap, and we've gone through three steps of the easing up, we're approaching uh, the fourth, is the link between transmission of the virus and any variants and hospitalizations. And it is that critical question. We know we've made great progress in weakening the link between transmission, as you described, and hospitalization, which is, of course, those who uh, are more seriously sick. The question is whether we've severed and broken it. We're looking at the data in real time, and the PM will set out the position tomorrow. Um, of the, all the people in the country, you mentioned all those who've been vaccinated, but 12 million people have still only had one dose, and 11.5 million are completely unprotected at the moment. Does that mean that if we have a delay, that period is entirely to roll out the vaccine uh, more quickly and more effectively to all those people who are still unprotected? Is that the object? I think you're right to characterise the race we're in is to get everyone up as far as we possibly can to two doses because that maximises the effectiveness both uh, of risk of harm, serious harm to people, but also uh, we know it's more effective at cutting the transmission. So I think it is right to characterise that as the test. The question is what the evidence says about whether we've broken the link, uh, severed the link, not just weakened it, between transmission and hospitalisation. Well, I've been looking at Public Health England data. If it turns out that that link is not broken, and if it turns out that hospitalizations are again on a fast rise, does that mean that we could also go back on some of the measures that we uh, got out of in May? In other words, could we reverse some of the restrictions? Well, for forgive me if I don't get drawn into hypotheticals, but what I can tell you is we've made great progress. We have weakened the link between uh, transmission of the virus and hospitalisation. But the, the, the acid test, if you like, though, critical questions, have we broken the link? Uh, that's the crux of it. There are other factors, of course. And we're looking at the data. We get data coming in all the time. It's looked at in real time. And uh, let me allow the Prime Minister to set that out in the round tomorrow. If you decide that you can't get rid of all those restrictions, do you think you can hold the Conservative Party together on that? Yes, look, we'll be evidence-based, data-based. Um, I think the, the key point is we want to move out of lockdown irreversibly. I think uh, the vast majority of people in the country, but also in Parliament, will understand that. We don't want a yo-yo uh, back in and out of uh, measures. Of course, we really understand those that are hankering to get to the fourth step both businesses but also people uh, who want to be able to socialise even more than you can under the current Step 3 restrictions. So we'll, we, of course we're sensitive to all those concerns. But we've got to be data and evidence driven and uh, it's that critical link, as I said, between transmission and hospitalisations, which uh, is not the only test, there are four, but sure. is the one which is probably the most sensitive right now. So what do you say to those people who are watching the television this morning in agony, thinking, that's the end of my business, that's the end of my job, I can't take any more of this, it's ridiculous. What do you say to them? I share the, the, the anguish. 
Uh, we've, uh, we've, we know businesses have been struggling through the pandemic. That's why we delivered this, this enormous package of support for businesses. Um, we, we want to get uh, out of uh, step four as soon as we can, but we don't want to be going back and forth. We want to deal with it irreversibly, and that means we've just got to check the data. We haven't, I'm not prejudicing any decision that we made tomorrow, um, trying to give sure. uh, viewers a sense okay. of, uh, of what's at stake. And also, in fairness, uh, Andrew, we have said from the start we would open up to the fourth step no earlier than the 21st of June, and we said at the start we would always be guided by the evidence. I think we've been faithful to the, the roadmap and the strategy and the criteria. Right, you sound like you're being pretty cautious at the moment. Let me ask you about another dilemma in facing you all, uh, which is that if you delay reopening for, I don't know, a few weeks and so forth, the longer you delay it, the bigger the danger is that when we get the next surge or the next wave, it happens towards the autumn and winter when the NHS is already struggling and that therefore there is a sweet spot to ensure that the NHS doesn't face that crunch. I don't quite follow that. The, the, the critical thing is to get as many of the adult population, and we're now starting vaccinating those under 30, uh, double vaccinated as possible. And we've always said we were aiming to do that by the end of July. At that point, again, we can go irreversibly uh, uh, through the gears, if you like, and, and, um, uh, and open up in a way that we uh, haven't okay. been able to do to date. So I, I, I think regardless of what we do in so, step four, the crucial overarching immediate objective is to get those second doses dispensed. So we're talking about vaccinations. If you go back to the 20th of March, we were administering more than 800,000 doses in a single day. It's down now to 500,000. Once we were leading the, all the major countries in the world at the speed of our vaccination programme, now France, Germany, Italy, Uruguay and many other countries are faster than we are. Straightforward question, can we vaccinate fast enough for the restrictions to be lifted on the 21st? Or yes, indeed two weeks later? Yes, Andrew, there's a distinction between how fast you're going and how many you vaccinated. I don't think any of those countries um, are, uh, are ahead of us in terms of the volume of people, the proportion of the country vaccinated. But, but to be honest with you, we're in a win-win situation here. We want everyone to be vaccinated. We, we're not looking to, um, uh, uh, mm. to claim bragging rights. But the, the crucial thing is, of course, uh, whether you're dealing with those communities uh, where there's a bit more vaccine hesitancy or whether you're dealing with those who haven't taken up the, the offer, um, mm. the, the, it's probably harder at the end when you're just trying to bridge that gap between the three quarters that we've had double vaccinated and the 55% yeah. we've had single dose vaccinated. So we're doing everything we can. We've got the doses, um, but it is probably a little, bit, uh, a little bit harder than at the beginning when you've got so many people who are, uh, who are hop yeah. hopping and skipping into the vaccine centres wanting to get that jab. We're a different stage now so um, but we're making great progress let's not forget the progress we've made I, um, but we're at that last lap yes. if you like and we need to just make sure we're careful sure. and you say we've got the doses but of course an awful lot of those doses are AstraZeneca doses and because of the relatively small risk of blood clots in younger people we've stopped giving people under 40 AstraZeneca now we know what we know about the Delta variant and hospitalizations and how fast it's spreading it looks to many people as if the balance of risk has shifted somewhat and we should reconsider giving AstraZeneca vaccines of which we have plenty to those younger people Oh, I think we look at this very carefully. We take the scientific advice uh, and we've got both uh, the volume, the range in terms of supply chains, but also the quality of vaccines. Um, it is a bit like uh, if you look at the job that Nadim Zahawi has done, trying to make sure that the, the doses come at the right time. It's a, it's a jigsaw puzzle that needs to be put together. But that's not fundamentally the, the problem we've got or the challenge we've got. It is the race to get everyone double dose vaccinated, so, to, which is the most sure. effective uh, protection against transmission, but also uh, hospitalisation. Are you going to reassess, therefore, whether under 40 should get the AstraZeneca vaccine? Well, uh, 
the, that's a question for the medical authorities, the scientific authorities. We wouldn't take any step that wasn't no. very uh, carefully considered. We'd take the scientific advice as we've done all along, um, and we'll, we, we would make that decision if we, if we felt there was an imperative uh, to do so. We're on track. That's not the issue. And remember, we said that we wanted to get every adult vaccinated by the end of July. The question is quite, as, as I said before, is quite how far we are down that track in terms of breaking the link between transmission and hospitalisation okay. to make the step uh, to step four under the roadmap. That's the, that, frankly, that is the crux of the issue. Mm. Well, here's another crux, possibly. Are you personally convinced that double vaccination protects us properly against the Delta variant? Because according to Public Health England data, of 42 people who died from the Delta variant in the last reporting period, uh, 14 of them were, had had their second dose, and had, sorry, 12 of them had had their second dose 14 days previously. So that means a quarter had been double vaccinated and still died. Well, well, hold on a minute here. As you know, it takes three weeks, not two weeks, to have the full impact of the vaccine. So there is a bit of lag time, and it depends what the overall numbers of people mm -hmm. having uh, the vaccine in the pool that you, the sample you cited. I, I, I would be a bit careful about citing statistics out of context like that. I know, I know, you, I know you're, you're, you want to test the, the thesis that we're putting forward, but we are confident in the mm -hmm. uh, safety of the vaccine. Mm -hmm. Of course, you've got to compare it to the risk of not getting the first or the second dose and the risks of COVID. Yeah. Right, I, I hear that. Let's move on a little bit and talk about how we've got here, because this is a very, maybe sunny and lovely, but it's a very, very tough moment for the country. Um, Professor Geoffrey Barnett, who's leading the genome sequencing at the Wellcome Sanger Institute, says this. He says, now, looking back, it's clear that a major part of why we are now faced with a growing wave of cases of the Delta variant is because there were hundreds of introductions from abroad during April. The Prime Minister has talked about the need to learn lessons. Is that one of the lessons you need to learn? Well, we've got a, uh, an inquiry that uh, the Prime Minister said we should have, take stock of the lessons. I think uh, in relation to, for example, travel restrictions, we've got a system where we get flagged, variants of concern, variants under investigation. We take action when we get that advice, and that's what we've done all along. Um, and, and don't get me wrong, it's right to look back and see what lessons that should be learned, but we've taken the advice that we've had as we've had it in real time, uh, well, and that's the only thing you can do in this pandemic. I understand that, but obviously we're in, we're in this situation where we're wondering what lessons have been learned. Now, the government knew that there were potentially dangerous variants coming from India on the 1st of April. You knew that because Public Health England were telling you that, and yet you waited 22 days. I just ask you, in all candour, people understand these are hard decisions, but in all candour, waiting that long was a mistake, wasn't it? No, that's a, if, if, if I may, Andrew, that's an inaccurate reflection of what happened. We took the uh, decision to bar uh, travel from India before uh, we got from PHE the uh, flagging that this was a variant of concern and before it was subject to uh, the investigative step. So we monitor, of course, the ebb and flow of variants in real time, but we have a triage system, if you like, so decision makers know mm -hmm. when there's a point of concern where you must act, and we were in advance of that. And that's very clear from the timeline. All right, well, let's turn to the other big subject of the morning, which is Northern Ireland. So far as you're aware, and you've spoken to the Prime Minister, I'm sure, did President Macron of France describe Northern Ireland as being not a proper full part of the UK? Well, Andrew, forgive me if I don't divulge the, uh, the, the detail of what was discussed behind closed doors. What I Go will on. say is this. Um, I'm <laughs> um, actually, what I can tell you is uh, various EU figures here in Carbis Bay, but frankly for months now and years, have characterised Northern Ireland as somehow a separate country. And that is wrong. It is a failure to understand the facts. It is a failure to appreciate what speaking around Northern Ireland in those terms and approaching the issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol in those terms does. It causes damage uh, to businesses from both communities in Northern Ireland, creates deep consternation. Um, and we wouldn't talk about Catalonia in Barcelona, in Barcelona or Corsica in France in those ways. What we want now 
is a flexible approach which looks at all of the provisions in the Northern Ireland Protocol, not just those that protect the EU, but those that protect free flow between, of trade between Great Britain and Northern Ireland. The ball is in the EU's court. The PM was very clear about it. We're willing to be flexible and pragmatic, but they must come back with the reciprocal goodwill to make that mm. happen. And it doesn't sound like that's happening at the moment. What did you personally feel when you heard those comments? Well, it's not new to me. I've been Brexit Secretary, I've been Foreign Secretary for a while now. Um, I think it shows that there's still a, a failure to appreciate what uh, that level of misunderstanding, I think that's the polite way of putting it, of the situation in Northern Ireland and, uh, uh, can have. And it has real rep repercussions on the ground Is it for the offensive? communities there. Yeah, I think it is offensive. We would, again, we wouldn't dream of talking of northern region of Italy, uh, the, uh, the German Lander, uh, or other uh, provinces, particularly ones where there are, uh, there are these uh, uh, nationalist pressures. We wouldn't dream of talking about those yeah. uh, uh, areas in those terms. What we want is a bit of respect from the other side, a bit of flexibility, a bit of goodwill. Okay. With that, if the so EU are willing to show that, we can, we can chart a course well. through. In terms of respect and flexibility, President Macron also says nothing is negotiable and everything is applicable. Are we now heading towards a trade war? The President is right, which is why the EU needs to apply Article 6 of the Northern Ireland Protocol to facilitate the free flow of trade between Britain and Northern Ireland. And if the Commission and the EU uh, stick to that, indeed mark the words of President Macron, we can find a pragmatic way through. What we cannot have is a lopsided approach uh, built on some of the flawed assumptions that you have yourself articulated um, and which have very real effects for the communities on all sides in uh, Northern Ireland. Can I also just say, I have to say, I know the media have been all over this, this has been rather a peripheral issue in Carbis Bay given what the G7 has talked about and decided uh, mm. at the summit over the last few days. Well, I'll, I'm sure you're going to ask come me about on that. in a second some of those other issues. But j j I am, absolutely. But just on this, the EU says very clearly that it will retaliate with trade measures if Britain extends the grace period. Are we going to extend the grace period? We're going to behave flexibly, pragmatically. We have a series of proposals we've put to the EU. Mm. The ball is in their court. What we are not going to do is allow the economic, constitutional, territorial integrity of Northern Ireland to be put at risk. That is clearly provided for and safeguarded in the Northern Ireland Protocol and the Good Friday Agreement. We need the EU to step up with proposals that can deal with uh, all of these issues. Just to, can I give you one uh, brief bit of evidence here? One in five well, of all controls and checks uh, around the EU's periphery, from the Central and Eastern Europe to the Mediterranean. One in five of those controls and checks to protect the integrity of the single market are now conducted in Northern Ireland. That's triple what we see in Rotterdam, double what we see in France. That shows you in real terms how disproportionate mm. and frankly um, uh, uh, lopsided the approach has been. Does that intuitively sound to you right? One in five checks the entirety of the perimeter of the EU are in Northern Ireland. Okay. Well, let's move away from the steeples of Fermanagh and Tyrone to the wider world, which you've been discussing here. Um, this summit has agreed that a billion doses of vaccine can go to the rest of the world to help vaccinate the rest of the world, which sounds, and indeed is, a lot, until you hear the World Health Organization say that 11 billion doses are urgently needed to vaccinate the world and stop new variants reappearing on our shores as well as everybody else's shores. Um, given all of that, isn't it a drop in the ocean? And doesn't it mean that the, these countries, desperate for vaccines, are going to look to China and to Russia for vaccines, exactly what this G7 summit was set up to avoid? So the G7 has met probably after the worst crisis since the Second World War. And what you've seen here, and you'll see it in the communique, helpfully published at around two o'clock, just in time for the football. You can read it at half time. It will show a step change, a global gear shift in international collaboration. And I do think there's a sense that, that countries have been going their own way. We haven't had that. And it's going to deal with climate, girls' education, and of course, this critical issue 
of, of COVID vaccines. Now, you're right that, the, to, to cite the WHO, but what we've done, and, the, and uh, the G7 have made existing commitments of a billion doses, we've come together to try and bridge the gap. And the difference that the billion doses that has now been committed by the G7 will make, and led very much by the 100 million extra doses that the UK has uh, put in, and then we've galvanised others to come on, it's a team effort to put in. What that will do is bring the point at which the world can be vaccinated uh, uh, forward. So instead of being at the end of 2024, which is the current tra trajectory, it will be the middle of next year. Now, of course, we want to go even faster, but that shows you, that shows you, that's just one illustration, okay. the many All things right. the G7 has grappled with. And I think it shows you sure. the step change in all collaboration, right. and that's what Global Britain's all about. Okay. All right, Dominic, Rob, thanks so much for joining us this morning. That's all we've got time for from beautiful St. Ives. I hope it's as nice where you are, but thanks for watching anyway. And until next Sunday, goodbye.